All right, I think we'll, um, we'll get started. So you can see I was a little bit uh, starstruck yesterday at a barbecue. Uh, the inventor of pandas, Wes McKinney, was there. Frances um, Altet, who's um, originally from Valencia, uh, he's the guy that invented pie tables, um, which we'll see later on today. It's sort of an interf a nice Pythonic interface to a file format called HDF5. Uh, Fernando, who you know well, the inventor of IPython. Travis Oliphant, the inventor of NumPy, uh, former president of, um, of Nthought. He's now uh, CEO of a new company called Continuum Analytics. And uh, Paul Ivanov, one of the major contributors to Matplotlib. And then there were others around. And those of you that went to PyData, I guess, also got to meet Guido. So it's been like an awesome Python time. Uh, and then this week upcoming is PyCon. In fact, probably a number of people uh, from my group are not here because, or people I know because they're at PyCon. I'll mention that later on. Was there a question in the back? Did you have a question in the back? Oh, I thought you were doing it. Okay. So, subject of today uh, is databases with Python. And probably many of you have seen this sort of symbolic representation of a database, just, I don't know, three little disks or stacks on top of each other. Um, Python has uh, some very beautiful interfaces to some of the most powerful uh, databasing systems available today. Um, and some might argue that if there isn't a Python API or Python hook into that database, it's not going to get the kind of adoption that it needs. Um, so many who are building new types of database systems are well aware that those that are going to be working with them are going to be, uh, many of them will be uh, Pythonistas. So the overview of today, a little bit different than what we've done uh, in the past. Because we're going to be talking about databases, I thought it's important to get everybody on the same page, understanding what a database actually is. And then we'll get into some of the nitty gritty of how Python interacts with that database. But really, for the first uh, hour or so, I'm going to be talking about databases. And then we'll be interacting um, with a nice little uh, database system that you've already installed called SQLite. Three, we'll be working with that from the command line, helping us to flesh out some of our understanding of how databases actually work. And then we'll have Chris um, jump in, and he'll talk to you about how uh, Python views those databases. And then we'll talk at the end about a file format system called HDF5, which is um, sort of a nice marriage of uh, industrial strength databases but with sort of a file format sense. Um, so you'll see more of that uh, as we go through um, today's lecture. What are databases? Why are we even using databases? That's the first subject we'll get into, then um, introduce you to generic concepts of uh, databasing, um, and in particular talk about relational databases and the so-called SQ, SQL. Um, then we'll go into SQLi3 and, and its connection to Python, MySQL, and, and Postgres we'll do a bit of. And we'll end with HDF5 and a bit of NetCDF4. Um, so I'm sorry for those that are very conversant and well aware of what databases are. I, I do want to sort of take a, a step back, present a high level overview of what databases are, the collection of data in an organized way. And it's um, managed essentially by definition by a so-called database management system, or DBMS. DBMSs generally offer storage. That is really their, uh, their main use, but also the creation and manipulation of data uh, in the concept of that storage platform. Um, the other main use is being able to access results from uh, queries on that uh, uh, large uh, storage. And that's what we call search. And more and more, what you're saying is that Database systems aren't just sort of there for collecting data and for allowing you to search on it. It's also now allowing you to make some sort of native high-level data operations. So instead of just saying, give me the average of everything in some row, you might now say, give me the fast Fourier transform of everything in that row. And while you could pull the data out of the database system and do a for fast Fourier transform, as you saw in your last homework, within Python, there's some nice things. if the uh, algorithms are being built into the system itself, and it can be run natively, essentially, within the, within the database. So before we get into third party, you might say, why are we doing this? Doesn't Python already have a nice way for me to store data? So for instance, if on the command line I said db equals range of 1 to 1,000, skipping every other, uh, every other number, 
and then I stick into the index 10, spam a lot. I grab index 31, that's perhaps like uh, doing a lookup, and I've got uh, the number 15. And then if I want to store it, that's easy. I just pickle it up, or if it's a numpy array, then I could also just do a numpy, uh, a save, um, a save Z. Um, and so this is great, because if I want to get back that data, I just open that file up, and I can do what I want to do on it. But there are significant limitations, as I'm sure you all know. I mean, what we've been doing in this course until now is really talking about um, algorithms, a bit of workflow, uh, interacting with the real world. But we haven't really got to the core of what it means to be a scientist. And I think for many of us um, across a number of different physical science disciplines, being a scientist now means dealing with tremendous amounts of data. And so um, Python has, as you know, the ability to deal with lots of data um, natively. But here are some of the major limitations. One is that when we search on a list, that's very slow. So if we did a you know, list name dot find and we try to find some element, we try to find what index that element is in, that's quite slow. That's order n. Uh, we know that databases, if we're going to, in this sense, if we're going to keep them uh, in memory, they can only be as big as the available RAM to us. Um, and one of the issues, of course, although the save z uh, with a numpy uh, mitigates this a little bit, is that if we want to efficiently store those files in the form of pickling, we have some portability issues where if I want to now hand that file off to somebody, say, that uses MATLAB or uses some other code base, um, they're going to have to do some translation on that, on that file format. So there's a portability issue. Um, and then, of course, if we're interacting with a file, uh, only one um, uh, Python instance is going to be able to interact with that file and sort of own that file. Now, other, other Python instances could look at the same file and try to map what's in memory uh, on disk. But um, giving multiple Python instances read-write access to the same part of memory is very scary, because it's, it's not very well managed. In fact, it's not managed at all. In terms of searching, um, indexing is uh, what you generally want to do, that allows you to make very fast queries. We're essentially hashing up words or numbers, and you're allowing to search through hash tables instead of searching uh, you know, in sort of a regular expression way. Those that took the boot camp uh, perhaps remember one of the first dictionaries that we presented. Um, here we have a dictionary uh, from Monty Python of a bunch of different scenes. Remember, there's the cheese shop scene, there's the spam uh, scene. The actors in that, John, John Cleese and Michael Palin uh, in the first one, um, Eric Idle, John Cleese in the second one. And then we might have some information about those actors. This is effectively what a database is doing. It's, it's a relational database at some level. Um, and so we might know a lot about uh, uh, these various uh, people and how funny they are. Uh, we might have some numerics on that, how old they are, et cetera. But if I now want to ask a question, for instance, what's the average age of the actors in the cheese shop scene? You essentially have to go through and do what we will wind up calling joins on these various, uh, on these various uh, uh, keyword um, value pairs. So how would you do this um, if you were going to try to answer that question? Well, you might say, OK, go to, this, go to this different scenes. Give me the cheese shop. Give me the actors in that and then loop over actors um, until I wind up getting Cleese and Palin, essentially do a search on the values associated with the keyword actors, uh, and then wind up grabbing those ages, and then take an average of that result. So there, is, there are ways to store data within Python. There are ways to search within Python. Um, but given all those limitations and caveats, it makes sense that Python's real solution to this is to third party it when you're dealing with massive amounts of data, and dealing with that data in the way that modern scientists might want to deal with that data. So if you go to this web page, wiki.python.org, uh, and database interfaces, you'll wind up seeing all the different ways in which we can interact with different um, database solutions. And this is a huge ecology in the commercial world. It's also got a lot of open source su support in, for some of these. In particular, MySQL and Postgres, while MySQL is now, I think it's owned by Oracle, they have an open source version of, uh, of that. Um, many of these others are you actually have to pay a lot of money for, but there are actually Python interfaces to those. So generally, when we're talking about these very large code bases, 
what you what you typically see are people in the Python uh, scientific community working with MySQL and Postgres. Now this itself is also changing as new sort of science ready databases are starting to to pop up. I'll mention that towards the end of the uh, lecture. Um, this is somewhat outdated, and chances are, if you're very used to in your in your own research lab working with a certain one of these solutions, chances are there's already a Python interface to that. And we'll talk about in detail what it means to have a Python interface to these various databases. Okay, so let's, um, let's go with uh, just trying to understand what it means when we talk about a database management system. What are those frameworks? What are sort of the different layers of um, our understanding of, of these systems? Well, first is the external. It's what users of the database will see. So if you're interacting with a database at the Python command level, you're going to see some representation of the data. It's a high level abstraction of how the data actually live in memory. Um, and depending on how sophisticated your database system is, you're going to have uh, perhaps different password protections. So some people might have different views of the data uh, than you. There's the conceptual, which is sort of the underlying uh, architecture of how the data is meant to be accessed um, by the external users. And that's the logical structure of the database. It defines the relationships between the data, the security details, and typically we wind up calling this the database scheme. And when you have multiple schemes, you have schema. Do you know what you have when you have multiple schema? Schemata. Um, okay, so, uh, and then there's the last thing, which is where a lot of the architecture comes in for those that are building new databases from scratch and they have a new concept of how you might access memory, um, is the physical, how the data is actually stored, how it's managed at the low level, how you go from the actual bits and bytes on disk to uh, this conceptual layer. And this physical layer is becoming increasingly more important as we start thinking about uh, routinely interacting with data that's much larger than RAM, much larger than what you can get on a single node of a computer, but now you start thinking about distributed databases across multiple nodes and perhaps not even in single uh, physical locations like in a data center, but now perhaps distributed over the entire internet. In the end, what you'd like to have effectively is the external users not notice and not really care how that data is distributed, but in practice, when you're interacting with that data and you're actually searching on that data, how the data is distributed in the end will wind up dictating sort of what you can and can't do um, in, uh, uh, at, at the SQL level. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about essentially that sort of middle layer, the implementation, the conceptual layer, uh, what we call the, the data model. Um, there are a bunch of different flavors of data model and, and, and recognize that uh, just because I have um, one file format doesn't mean I can't have and I'm sort of uh, 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 pushed into one of these different um, uh, data models. Living on disk is in some ways different than how you present and how you conceptualize um, that data. So the first way we think about uh, databases is so-called relational databases. And now we think about data sort of organized into tables or two-dimensional tables. And we think about the connection of that data across tables with the concept of keys. And we'll see much more of that um, later. Another way to think about that data is in an object-oriented sense. So you think about now not tables, but you think about entities, which have a similarity to tables. But now there's the concept of sort of inheritance. Um, now there's the, all the things that we get out of the class structure in Python um, is uh, possible. Most of the database solutions out there are relational in, uh, in nature. There are some, um, some called uh, db 4 which is a big one, and Bigtable from Google. These are object-oriented by trait. There are abstractions that allow you to try to go in between relational and object-oriented databases. Um, but one which is sort of gaining some level of popularity is the so-called hierarchical database. And this is more thinking of the data in a tree-like way. Um, uh, or you think of it like a document. So if you think about an XML document or you think about a JSON string, um, Exist is one of the well-known uh, XML-based databases, MongoDB, CouchDB, et cetera. These are sometimes known as NoSQL databases. Uh, and if people are interested in why that is, um, you can talk about it later. But effectively, it's not NoSQL. 
it's, it's no SQL, but you haven't defined your schema yet. Um, or it's a dynamic schema, to be more precise. OK, so let's look at uh, the architecture, the conceptual layer of a relational database. Um, here we have four tables. The names of the tables are study, subject, questionnaire, and question. Um, and you can see at the very bottom of each of these tables is the kind of data that we might want to have in them, uh, in each of these tables. And there'll be an arbitrary number of rows in these tables. Um, the other thing to note are these things called PK, or primary keys. These are the things that are indexed, so they can be uh, looked up and searched on very rapidly um, and compared against each other very rapidly. Um, it makes sense to call these things, in this case, study. Uh, the primary key would be study ID, uh, subject, uh, SID, etc. cetera. Uh, when you think about creation of a new row, so let's say I wanted to create a new study and I'm going to be surveying a bunch of, uh, of, uh, of students or people um, in general, I might have the name of this study. This might be, you know, hot or not. Uh, PI name, that's me. Is it completed? No. How many subjects are there going to be um, in this study? And then perhaps I want to create another questionnaire, another questionnaire. For each questionnaire that I create, there'll be another study. Um, and uh, I'm going to wind up having um, this sort of high level metadata about that study. Then that study is going to involve a questionnaire. And I might have a number of different questionnaires for a given study. Um, so I might have a hot or not study. I might have a hot or not for animals or something. And that could be part of the same study to figure out whether animals or people are hot or not. Um, sorry if I'm <laughs> abstracting too much. Or maybe, no, I'm getting more, uh, getting more specific than I ought to be. Um, this primary key of a questionnaire, every time I create a new questionnaire, uh, will be associated with so-called foreign keys. And the foreign keys are my ways of looking back at what this is associated with. It's essentially my way of merging tables. So the foreign key of one table is the primary key of another table in general. Um, and so here the foreign key uh, points back to uh, the study. So this questionnaire, when I create a new row in the questionnaire table, will be pointing back to one study. Now, there are ways of creating this architecture such that you might have a questionnaire that might be part of two studies. But the way that this is made, uh, laid out here, that's not actually possible. If you want to do it, you essentially have to repeat two rows, but they'd have a different foreign key on STID. Um, the other thing uh, is that um, there's going to be uh, a subject um, that will be taking part in this questionnaire. And uh, you might wind up um, having your uh, subject ID here as your primary key. And the subject may be part of different questionnaires. Um, so they may actually take uh, a, bunch of different, uh, a bunch of different questionnaires um, that they're answering. And then there's the questions, et cetera. I won't go into the details because it doesn't really matter the, what the implementation is here. What I wanted you to notice is that there's this concept of sort of the data that this table is really about. Um, and then there's the connections between these different tables. And the zero dot, dot, dot star means that's how many of them there can be when I create it. Um, so when I create, I don't have to even create any questionnaires, and I have a really simple, uh, I have a really simple database because I haven't actually done anything interesting. But when I create a questionnaire, I want to have at least one question associated with it. That's what that one dot, dot star means. This is a very complicated uh, object-oriented database where it's some sort of ecology of people taking classes and people teaching others and people making money um, because they're teaching classes. Um, I won't go into a great deal into object-oriented databases, only to show you that it looks a lot like uh, classes and subclasses and inheritance. In particular, if you look at an employee, you might say that every employee has the concept of a salary. And that salary may not just be a number. It may be the date in which they're paid, uh, whether they're paid on a nine-month basis or a 12-month basis. So that in and of itself uh, might be captured in the form of a table. Um, but we have different types of uh, people who are employees. There's assistants and assistant professors and staff, et cetera. So assistants would have. Uh, its own set of, if you want to think about it um, in the concept of a Pythonic way, it might have its own set of attributes that are not part of the generic employee, 
But everything that the employee has and points to is something that will be inherited by the assistant, and likewise the professor, and likewise the, uh, the staff. Um, and so it allows you uh, to sort of uh, create a high-level view of um, the relationships. But fundamentally, in the end, what's happening under the hood is you're really creating uh, primary keys and foreign keys. A fairly different concept of a database, but one which tends to be pretty intuitive for a lot of um, scientists, is a hierarchical database. Uh, this is represented here in this, um, this little graph. We have the concept of what electronics are. And again, there could be kind of metadata that go along with each entry in this row. Um, and then we have two kinds of electronics. We have televisions and portable electronics, and different types of televisions, and different types of portable electronics. Um, again, you, you might be able to create this, and you will be able to create this in a relational database sense, but conceptualizing the entire universe of the stuff you're interested in with this sort of Venn diagram and these nested structures inside of it um, is actually very helpful. We'll see a lot more about hierarchical databases towards the, uh, towards the end of the course, uh, the end of the lecture today. Okay, so we have different conceptual layers. I talked about relational databases, um, uh, object-oriented and hierarchical databases. And now we want to sort of talk about how they're actually implemented in the real world. Um, most uh, database management systems are ones that are essentially have a server concept to them, where I'm a client, and I want to connect to a database, and I want to interact with some tables uh, in that database. This server sense is one where you, th you think of it as a persistent code, which is just waiting to be interacted with. So you might just start up MySQL or Postgres, and you think of it as essentially just sitting there listening on a port and waiting for somebody or some client to interact with it. The nice part of this, of course, is that it's persistent. So it's very fast. When I want to connect to a database and get going, I, I hope that if I have a good server, um, it already has preloaded some of the types of things that I'm going to want to be interacting with. For instance, if I'm going to be connecting and I want to actually you know, give it a password so I can get permissions to certain tables or certain databases, um, then you hope that it sort of preloaded all the permissions tables, which are themselves represented as, as, as tables. Um, and then, indeed, that's uh, generally what, what happens. Um, the other nice thing about a server is that uh, this server could itself have a bunch of different sort of master-slave uh, where it's doing a lot of replication for you. It's keeping the data um, fresh. It's making sure that if a node goes down, you as a client connecting to that server doesn't even notice it because basically all the connections are made for you. Server goes, or a client goes, uh, sorry, uh, I, I got to be very careful with my language here. If a slave goes down, the master says, ah, we got to make sure that we're directing all of our search traffic essentially to these other slaves. Um, if some of the data gets corrupted and the uh, server knows how to deal with corrupted data, it will start replicating that data in other places to make sure that you have um, you know, a very robust uh, uh, data set. Um, so that's the vast majority of the systems. Um, and then there's the so-called embedded database management systems. And this is where there is no server. What you do as a client is you essentially connect to a persistent file, um, on, usually on, on disk, and uh, you wind up interacting directly with the database. So you have a bunch of um, APIs, and uh, th there's a layer between um, the, the low-level APIs which connect to the database, and then, say, Python. And in Python, you say, you know, connect to the database. And what you're doing is essentially attaching yourself to a file. So there is no server. In a client-server system, it's pretty nice because you can have multiple clients logging in from all over the world, um, all interacting with the same data. And the, the, the server is essentially going to manage the transactions that people might uh, be doing on a database. So if I'm interacting with a table and I'm sitting here and I wind up updating a column in the database and somebody else is trying to do the same thing, the implementation of the database management system will manage those conflicts and will sort of say, nope, that person has priority because that's how this database was created. Um, or it'll have a sense of transactions where everything you do instead of a transaction is effectively protected until you commit that transaction and then it's managing conflicts between those. In an embedded database, you don't usually have that sort of mitigation. 
And so you generally don't use embedded databases unless you're pretty sure that your client is the only thing that's generally interacting with that database. So if it's just you sitting there playing with your data and it's going to be in a big database, it isn't ridiculous to think about it uh, in the context of one of these embedded systems. If it's going to be you interacting with lots of data and updating lots of data, and then five other people from your lab logging in from all over the world and interacting with the same data set, it'd be silly to be thinking about it as an, uh, with an embedded solution. Regardless, all of them are fast, safe, very scalable. Well, not all of them. The embedded ones tend not to be super scalable. Um, and, but any of the modern ones that people are using on a regular basis now, almost all of them have the ability to uh, operate over multiple um, nodes and operate in a very fast way and allow you to issue large, complex queries um, in a very efficient way. Okay, so um, I've sort of bandied around the uh, couple of different terms. Let me get specific about what I mean in the database model concepts. One is database, and that is the thing that contains tables. It has concepts of actions, which sometimes are called triggers. It deals with permissions and security. When you have a database management system, you can have multiple databases, and one client can connect to one database, another client can connect to another database, and a third client can connect to the second database at the same time that the second client is connected to that database. And that database management system is uh, dealing with that for you. Actions are interesting because if somebody, say client three, updates a row, you may have essentially created what are called uh, triggers where every time a row in that table is updated by that person, somebody else gets an email. And so you have a concept of being able to embed actions as the data is changed and interacted with. Tables, it's the data with a fixed number of columns and rows um, that you will then perhaps add data to. So you'll add more and more uh, rows as you get more and more data. Um, and it's the thing that you're going to wind up querying. And then keys, this thing that I presented before, it's, uh, it's essentially one column which is hashed. It makes it very efficient for looking it up. Um, and it makes it very efficient for joining tables. And I already presented to you the concept of a primary foreign key. And in fact, you can create um, hashes or indices um, on, uh, multiple, um, on multiple keys. So I can essentially create a tuple of keys and I can uh, hash on that, create an index on that, and make those sort of pairs or triplets um, or quadruplets very fast uh, to search over. Um, in document-based uh, databases, like these hierarchical ones, oftentimes tables are called collections, but you know, essentially that's just parlance. Um, OK, so let's start getting to play a bit with databases. And if you haven't already, Please go to bspace, resources, weekly files, and uh, please download, uh, there, there are two files there with a .sql at the end of it. And you can actually look at those SQL um, uh, files. We'll start interacting with them now. Um, databases are everywhere, whether you know it or not. Uh, almost everything you're doing on the web when you're searching, of course, is interacting with a very large scale database. Um, and even when you go to specific websites that aren't generally search engines, when you're interacting with that web page, generally you're being presented the results of what's some sort of high-level query. Um, the uh, sort of example that we'll be using now is interacting with um, collections of artwork. Um, so here is uh, the result of having interacted with a database when you say, go to the de Young Museum website and just show me stuff in the collection. Um, these are not static pages. These are pages that are um, generated when you, make that, uh, when you make that call to go to that, that site. And of course, you can also do um, searches. So if I want to search on Diebenkorn, I'm going to wind up getting back all the artwork by Diebenkorn and the de Young uh, Museum. And so what you're effectively doing is you're selecting from a table, uh, probably called artist, um, where the artist name is equal to Diebenkorn. You're getting um, basically the artist ID number, and then you're searching on another table uh, for all the artwork that has that artist ID number. Now, how you deal with it when you have uh, an artwork that's made by several artists, you know, not my problem. If you're, if you're designing the database, you have to think about that sort of stuff. So we're going to create our own collection of artwork um, just as a way of playing with uh, uh, databases. And what you should be able to do from the command line, uh, if you don't mind, 
um, bring it up uh, in a terminal, type SQLite 3, and then some name of a database. We'll just call it art.db. This file, um, which is the database, again, because we're going to be playing with SQLite 3, which is an embedded database, doesn't have to exist. We're going to essentially connect to and create uh, a new database. And what you should see is something like this. Is everyone able to do that? Most of you? Barian doesn't have his laptop open. Thank you, Barian. Um, OK, and now I'd like you to type uh, on, the, on this now command line. You see, just like when you type Python in your terminal, you get a little Python um, command line. Now you get an SQLite command line. Type dot read art dash create dot SQL. And what this is doing is you're basically reading in and issuing SQL statements. Um, we'll see more of what that means later on. And you're creating uh, a database on the fly, basically from a bunch of scripts inside of this um, SQL file. Um, whenever you have a dot inside of SQL, that is uh, sort of, if you want to think about it, as sort of magic functions within, within IPython. This is stuff that isn't about the database itself. It's, a, it's your sort of view of that database. So I can read essentially a script in and essentially issue those SQL um, commands. If you then type dot schema, you will see, although not beautifully colorized like this, something like this. And I want to go through this a little bit to show you what's actually happening. Um, so when I'm looking at the schema, and this is also something that will look very, very similar within the .sql file itself, um, you can see a bunch of commands. Um, and I essentially have three commands. And what are these commands doing? These are creating three tables for me. So I'm going to now create three. Yes? Um, when I type in .read art create SQL, it's telling me that it can't open um, do you, What are your file permissions on that, on that file? when you pulled it over. If you do uh, ls minus l on the file name, well, maybe, maybe I'll ask somebody to go over and just check it out. Is anyone else having troubles with it? OK. It may be, I, I bet it's a file permission issue. Um, OK, so what are we doing in that uh, create uh, art-create.sql? Uh, We're basically creating three tables. And lo and behold, the syntax isn't so it's saying create a table. And in the first case, we're going to call that table artist. We're going to create a primary key, and we're going to call it AID, which you know is art, uh, artist uh, index or artist ID. Um, it's not allowed to be null, so it can't be empty. Um, and we're going to start off at 0. Um, and every time I create a new row inside of that table, I want that number to be auto-incremented for me. This guarantees that I have a unique ID. Um, so what are some other uh, attributes of this table? Um, well, these are essentially different columns, the first name, last name, birth date. And you see that um, SQLite has the concept of a date time date. And if I don't give it when I create more, when I actually add a new row, I want you to set the default to be the current date, which is silly, right? It's an artist basically getting uh, a birth date of right now. So probably I want to set a different default of like you know, 1700 just to be sure that I uh, get some more reasonable data. Uh, birth country, that's going to be a text. Now I'm also going to create a table called museum. I'll have a museum ID. This will be the primary key of that table, name, country, uh, city. Likewise, work. I have a work ID. And now what you notice is I've got a couple other um, uh, indexes. This doesn't have to be called AID, but I like it to be called AID because then I know this is really a foreign key of the artist table. And these arrows are allowing me conceptually to think about the connection between these tables. When I create a work of art, it's going to have an artist associated with it. And when I create, uh, uh, and it will also have a museum where that art uh, currently lives. So if I take a piece of artwork and I move it to another museum, I can update um, this value inside of the work of art. L likely, I'm not going to attribute that artwork to another um, uh, artist, but maybe one day I realize that you know, this demon corn was actually painted by a three-year-old, and then I wind up pointing to a different um, uh, artist ID. 
All of this is called the data definition language, and in creation of your tables, you wind up getting pretty familiar with the different types of variables that you can have, text, and you can have just specific string length characters. You can have something called a blob, which is a very large, uh, which is a very large string, um, integers, floats, dates, etc. All right, so now let's um, load in some data. You're already in SQLite 3, you won't have to do this again. Um, but I want you to read in some data. So this is going to be a bunch of SQL commands that will essentially pump data into these three tables. So dot read art dash load dot SQL. Did you guys get your issue worked out? Was it permissions? It was the files weren't there yet. That is a permission issue. <laughs> Um, you are not allowed to look at things that are not there. <laughs> um, okay, we're going to do a little bit of SQLite just, uh, just to give us some pretty output. If you type dot header space on, this will give us some nice headers. Dot mode column, and you can read about in the, in the man pages essentially what this is doing, but it's just going to give us a pretty output when I do the following command in my data manipulation language, DML. Select star from table name is, in this case, we're going to select star from work. What do you think we get? Well, we're going to get all of the different columns of, um, of uh, the work table, and I'm going to wind up getting all the data associated with that. And SQLite 3 is pretty nice about showing us what a date looks like. And you see that I have every work ID that got auto-incremented when I added more data. Um, I have different artists. Uh, I'll have different titles, different types of the painting, um, and they're going to be in different museums. And you see here that I'm only pointing back to two different museums. And you see when, that, uh, when, when the work of art was, um, was finished. So these are basic queries that we're going to wind up doing in SQL. This is how we're going to start interacting with our rudimentary database. Select star from work gets all rows from the table work and prints out all the columns. That sort of makes sense, right? Select title, comma, type from work. And usually you need to put a semicolon at the end of this. Um, uh, almost all SQLs require you sort of terminate uh, your query with a semicolon. Get all rows from table work and print only those columns. So if I don't care, if I've got a table that's got 50 columns and I really only want to know the, the, the birth date and the first name of, of, of an artist, I would type select you know, birth date, comma, uh, first name from artist, and then I would get only those um, printing out. So you can give that a try now. Everyone OK with that? OK, good. So let's do some other things. Maybe um, I'm going to want to to sort of make some pretty columns, and I don't want it to be called work because it's not really clear what that means. Maybe I want to call it work type. Uh, so I can actually select title, comma, type as work type. So in the top um, column, when I'm printing out what each column is about, the top row, I'm going to be saying this is work type and not work, from work. So why don't you try that? And maybe I don't like first underscore name. Maybe I want capital first with a space name. And now you know how to do that. So one of the things to recognize here is that we're not actually natively changing anything about the underlying database. We are creating effectively a view of that database. This is a trivial view of that database. But we're really kind of renaming what we think of as one of these columns. So if I wanted to now take the results of this select statement and then select on that, I could actually uh, select on workspace type and not on, work, uh, not on type. Here's a more uh, complex query that actually is doing a little bit of math for you in the query itself. Select title, uh, date. This is a, um, a built-in uh, command within SQLite 3. And almost all uh, uh, databases have some concept of this of now, so this is going to be now, minus finish date, and I'm going to call that age, whatever the result of that subtraction is, from work, 
where the finish date is less than 1970, uh, January 1st, 1970, and I want to order by age in a descending fashion. So this is a slightly non-trivial query, um, but you can see uh, just how powerful it is. It's getting only those rows where the work was finished before 1970, and show the name and age and years descending uh, um, uh, in order uh, by age. You want to try that? And the other thing to try is try without the descending. Um, and you can press the up arrow, I believe, in SQLite 3 to get back the, the command you just issued. Um, you could try it with a uh, greater than sign if you want to, just to see what kind of differences you get. And again, your database has like 12 entries in it or something. So this, is, this would be trivial to do um, if you were doing this within Python. Uh, uh, say interacting with a with a sort of uh, a dict with three keywords, um, which would represent the tables. But now, if you think about this as some massive sort of compilation of all artwork in the universe, uh, this is the type of query you would issue and be able to interact with all of that data right away. Everyone okay with this? Okay. So let's do some other interactions. Um, select star from work where type equals painting. Um, hmm, that's weird. I didn't get anything, even though in my SQL table I had the, the works of painting and and uh, woodcuts and whatever. Um, it would require the value of type to be exactly painting, so it's case sensitive. Um, if I say like, that's allowing me to get access to strings that are like painting, and capital painting is the same as underscore paint or uh, lowercase pa painting. So I get back uh, a couple of different paintings. Um, let's try another one. Select star from work where type glob p star. That's allowing me to do, um, for those that are uh, used to globbing, um, and there is a Python module as well called glob, it allows you to do sort of Unix-like um, uh, searches on, on uh, words uh, or file names. So p star will give me everything that starts with a capital letter p and gives me as many uh, other characters after that. So I get the painting, but I also get, I also get a print, because it started with capital P. Um, if I only wanted things that started with lowercase p or capital P and then R I N T and then I don't care what happens after that, um, I might get uh, I might get these back. But if I have a star here, it means that I'm allowed to have the the characters P R I N T or capital P R I N T in the middle of the string. So what do I get back here? Ooh, I get a screen print. Um, and then it goes on uh, below the page. And you see this is cut off just because SQLite 3 is trying to make the columns sort of small for you. You can play with the different parameters of how you want it to present it. Um, so I hope you now have a sense a little bit of how you would wind up searching uh, within strings. I'll give you a tiny little breakout exercise, which will last one minute or two. What work was created less than 35 years ago and starts with the letter S? So who's got a solution? Yes, you want to tell us how you did it? Mm -hmm. You want to read out your SQL for us? Uh, I didn't actually bother with that part. There's only more, I just got to do five years ago. But it's, uh, 
Well, wait, no, you don't have a solution then. Now you have it? OK, read your SQL. Yep, and so what was your answer? Yeah. Everyone get that? So you, you're really doing um, essentially two where statements. Um, and you're going to say not where type, but you're going to say where title, uh, glob, um, and then in quotes, s star. Um, and, uh, which is how you connect uh, sort of different requirements. And uh, that thing you said, where it's the date of now minus um, the, uh, I guess we're calling it finish date, is uh, less than 35. And you'd have to know something about SQLite to know that when you do date subtractions, what you get back are ages in years. There are other ways to do date subtractions where you get it back, and you can actually convert the results of that subtraction into seconds, if that's how you wanted to interact with it. So that's knowing a bit about the, about the language um, that we won't have time to go into, unfortunately. OK, everyone OK with that? So now things get a little bit interesting, because until now, we've essentially just been interacting with a single table. Now I want to ask this question, what if I want to view all the works that are in Berkeley by American artists? So one way to do this would be select from the artist table um, all the uh, artists whose birth country was the USA. But now I want to take those, and I want to kind of merge those with a bunch of different works. But I want to make sure that those works are actually in the Berkeley Art Museum and not in the de Young Museum. So I want to find everything that's by a certain artist um, that uh, you know, is currently in Berkeley. Um, but I want to now print out those works. So this information is located in, the, to answer this question, is located in all three tables. And doing this in Python now starts to get a little bit um, hairy. Um, but here's how we would solve that. Uh, select museum.name. So this is kind of a new, um, uh, a new uh, representation here. Instead of saying select name, I'm saying museum.name because I'm going to wind up bringing in a bunch of different tables here. I'm going to join tables. Um, so if there were two uh, different column names within two different tables that was part of this query, I would wind up having a conflict, and SQLi3 would complain to me. So museum.name, I'm going to call that museum. Uh, artist.last name, I'm going to call it just artist, just to make it uh, easy. Work uh, title, work type, work finish date as date from work. So I'm selecting in the end what I really want to have is from work. But now how do I have access to the museum name um, or the, even the artist name? Well, I have to do a so-called join. And join basically says, um, there is a criterion that allows me to merge these tables together. And so I want to join the artist table on the following criterion. I want to say the artist uh, AID is equal to the work AID. And now I want to join the museum table as well, and I want to make sure the museum table is equal to work ID. So this is where the foreign key, primary key connections become very important. But I have a couple criteria. It allows now I've got sort of a full view of all of all three tables simultaneously, and I want to make sure the birth country is equal to USA, and the uh, museum city is equal to Berkeley. And so, what do I get out? Exactly what I was looking for. Um, I wind up getting the two works that are currently in the Berkeley Art Museum um, by artists that were born in the United States. Diebenkorn and Warhol. Um, there's not a lot of Warhol in the Berkeley Art Museum, unfortunately. There is a lot of Diebenkorn. And of course, now if I wanted to sort of select on things that were made in less than 35 years, I could add another where criterion. So typically what you see in SQL is you have select. That's the stuff you want to print out. 
Um, you have all of your join statements to connect all of the different tables together. And then you have your sort of filter criterion, your where criterion. And then at the very end, you have your order criteria. Um, this is a reasonable uh, uh, place to go to start getting up to speed on SQL Lite. And unfortunately, SQL is not sort of a common language across all database management systems. They all have their own sort of quirky ways of dealing with things. Um, and so, you, you know, knowing SQL and SQL Lite 3 database management system will get you 95% of the way of doing the same thing in Postgres or MySQL, but you'll wind up seeing some slight differences. Um, so you have to be careful when you're doing very complex things. It's not easily translatable across database management systems. So there are more advanced concepts uh, that I won't have a lot of time to go into. But within, um, within a database, you can create things called views, which sort of act like uh, virtual tables, where in some sense you can issue the query that I had before. And now if I want to always query on only artists that are, have artwork in Berkeley that were born in the United States, and I want to do more complex queries on that, I might create a static view of exactly that query and every time I interact with that view, I'm effectively interacting with it as if it was its own table. Um, but you're not actually creating any new data. You're just creating in the same concept of what we had with NumPy, where you create a new view of that same underlying data. We can do that as well. I already mentioned triggers. These are built-in actions that the database takes on itself when something else is done to it. So if I am really worried about people adding stuff to a certain row, I might create a trigger that um, creates a log of every time somebody interacts with that table. And then transactions, these are um, basically a protected series of interactions with the database, typically where you're adding something into the database or you're updating something in the database. And you want to make sure that if there's anything volatile that fails in there that you wind up rolling back to the last point before the transaction started. So a database has a sense of security on it um, that it, it won't get corrupted. Something else which uh, I didn't put in the slides here, but which is very important, SQLite 3 really doesn't have, most of the other database management systems do, is something called referential integrity. So that if I declare um, a, uh, a, uh, a certain key to be the foreign key of another table, if I delete that other table, it will wind up, if I said everything right, it will wind up deleting the row that's associated with it in the other table. So you can't have, I can't delete, uh, let's say, an art museum, and then these works are all pointing back to the Berkeley, Berkeley Art Museum, and there, that just doesn't exist. There's no more index two anymore in the, in the museum um, table. So referential integrity is something you typically want to have in your database, and most other database management systems sort of out of the box build that in for you. But typically when you're creating your, um, when you're creating your tables, you wind up um, sort of telling it uh, what are the foreign keys and what do you do if one of these things gets deleted. So those are other SQL statements that you make. Um, okay, so I'm going to hand it off to Chris now. We're going to now start talking about the Pythonic interfacing with um, SQLite 3. And then I'll come back at the end and uh, we'll talk about um, uh, HDF5. Any questions while Chris is setting up? Yes. The slides should be on BSpace. It should be under lectures and then week six dot zip. Is that right? Week seven dot zip. I think we're confused whether in week seven or not. Oh, does it? OK. Sorry. I think we're in week six. Oh. It's the most recent thing that's been added to BSpace. Oh, Chris, you need the thingy. Yeah. Yes. Something just fell off the microphone. That goes on the microphone.
OK, so I'm back again, as is uh, the anthropomorphic Python. Uh, so for the outline of probably the next 40 minutes to an hour is going to be, first, I'm going to talk about um, how to use SQLite 3 in Python. Basically, Josh just showed you how to do queries and joins, and I'm going to show you how to do those things, as well as creating a table and populating it with information uh, through Python. And then uh, we'll be doing some examples, kind of like the museum stuff or the Monty Python stuff using uh, Saturday Night Live skits. And then also an example of plotting stock data using a database to kind of simplify what would be uh, more difficult to do in normal Python. And then after that, just a couple of slides on MySQL and PostgreSQL, uh, which have modules for uh, Python. And then a breakout exercise, which is going to be using similar plotting techniques to what we did in, in part one uh, to plot seismograph stations across the world. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is uh, MySQLDB and PyGresQL uh, and all the other things I'll be talking about in part two, um, don't worry about if you have those or not. Uh, because the purpose, as Josh was saying, of this lecture is to introduce you to the 95% of the common syntax. And then if you know how to do SQLite 3, it'll be very easy for you to jump into MySQL, which will be one of the more common things you'll encounter outside of this classroom. OK, so SQLite 3 in Python is built in SQL database access. And it allows you to store the database either as a file or in RAM. And I'll be showing you how to do both of those in the examples. And it uses uh, the structured query language, which is that syntax that you'll be able to use in different types of database management systems. And it attempts to protect the database from corruption. Um, this is the type of uh, embedded system you would use if you were just working, working with stuff on your own local computer or laptop, and if you didn't have to share it easily with, uh, with other collaborators. In the next slides, I'll show you how to create a database, create a table in that database, insert some data, and then do queries as well as specific joins on columns within the different tables, and what are called left joins. Okay. So let's get into the, the part of it where I talk about actual running some code. I want you to follow along in the notebook, but I'm going to stay within the keynote up here. Uh, it, it will be the same code. Um, and the notebook you should be looking at is the SQLite 3, I think, notebook. Uh, the reason I'm going to do this is because I've made some graphical displays of the database, which kind of are not easily, I mean, the formatting of the output in the notebook is, is, contains the same information, but I think it's easier to see it as I've graphically presented it in the keynote, in the presentation here. And so it should be uh, part of the lecture materials from BSpace. Uh, are people finding it? Can you just say that again? Where is it? Uh, so it is in the lecture files. I care about this one. I mean, that's, that's the one you should have. I think I have it in a, I mean, this is what it is. And basically, each one of these blocks I'll be working through on a different slide. Um, but when it prints out stuff here, like this is kind of, what do we have? This is kind of icky looking. So it'll be nicer on the keynote, basically. That's the reason why I'm doing the in keynote. OK. So do the import, of course, first. And then we're going to create a connection. And this sqlite3.connect command, this is how we're going to say where the database is located. And so for now, uh, if you run this in that notebook, you're actually going to be creating a file called example.db within the slash tmp directory on your local disk. Um, I'll show you in another example how to do that into memory. But you don't have to worry about that too much now. Basically, the advantage to storing it in memory is that you don't have to delete it when you're done. You, you don't have to worry about it. But if it's in slash TMP, your system generally cleans that stuff out on its own. You don't have to worry about deleting it. 
Of course, you can if you want to after this. But it's not going to be a large file anyway. Uh, and then we're going to create a connection and, and through connection.cursor. And this is how we're going to be able to access that database. And all, every time that I want to send a command to, to SQLite 3, I'm going to do it uh, in this string, uh, where in this example, I'm calling it SQL underscore CMD. And then I'm using three quotes so that it can, uh, so that it can extend over multiple lines just for ease of readability. Uh, you can call this string whatever you want, but you do have to give it a string. And it has to be in SQL uh, syntax. So the command here is going to create a table. We're going to call it Dan Aykroyd. And then we're going to give it columns uh, with ID, which is going to be type, integer, and primary. It's going to be a primary key and auto increment, similar to how we did uh, artist ID or work ID in the previous examples from Josh. And then we're also going to have skit title, which is a text, air date, which is a date, Season, which is an int, episode, EP, which is an int, and role, which is text. Okay. So we're just creating this table in that database, and that's it. We're done. So let's look at what that database and table looks like. And this is it. It's just a bunch of blank columns right now. All we've done is set it up. In the next slide, we're going to populate it with some data. Okay. So let's in Python write out a list of tuples where each tuple is some skit data. So we're going to follow the same format as, as, we, as we defined in the table when we created the table uh, so that we've got the skit name, the air date, the season, the episode, and then Dan Aykroyd's uh, character or his role. And so we got three of these here from uh, the 70s when he was on the show. And then we're going to loop through skit data and basically just create an SQL command and then execute it for each skit in skit data. So this is our command syntax, which is just insert into table Dan Aykroyd. And then in parentheses, we give it the skit title, air date, season, episode, and role. And we, then this is all strings that we haven't, we haven't actually inserted from the skit data list yet, but then we convert role into a string at the end here. So this is what makes it kind of simple and advantageous to do it in Python, is we are scripting the insertion commands in SQL syntax in this loop. So I'll just I'll walk through it once more. Uh, the, the syntax is insert into and then the table name. And then in parentheses, we give it the essential column names. And then we say this uh, other special uh, I guess, special namespace values. And then after that, we convert the, the uh, this, is, this tuple, I'm sorry. Uh, we convert each one of these tuples into a string. And a tuple in string format is what the SQL syntax expects here. And then we just execute each one of those insertions, and we build up the database. And so if you're following along the notebook, you should now have uh, a print command, which prints out a similar looking table, except it's not organized quite as cleanly. But all the data should be there when you print that out. One of the important things to point out here is that the, the ID was not something that you gave it. Right. You ignored the ID. Thank you. That's a very good point. When we did auto increment, it, the SQLite knows to do that itself. It knows to auto increment uh, by one each time we give it an insertion command into Dan Aykroyd. So any, any questions on that so far? Uh, it, isn't there a, in the notebook it has a print? It does not? Well, let's well, so go you're to gonna notebook. You're going to execute, you're gonna, you're gonna do a cursor dot execute, and you're going to do a string select star from. It's right here. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yes, so it's, well, let me just load up everything here. Uh, oh. Yeah, it doesn't print out in that format, no. That's correct. Uh, so here I've done is I've just done the database creation, and I've, inserted, I've created the first table. 
And then here is the insertion of the data. And then uh, to run a simple query, that's right here. And then here we have it. Wow. So if you wanted to, if you wanted to, if we just select a star from Dan Aykroyd, we can delete this, and you can see everything there. That's right. So remove everything. Okay, and there's all three of them. Uh, right. That's thank you. I should I should speak to this because um, I don't think. Oh well, it's actually the next slide, so I can do it here. <laughs> so I wasn't printing it out before because I was just showing you how to insert data. So if you want to print it out, that's part of the query here, which is that next line in the notebook file. So we we just want all of the information for skits that happened after October twelfth, seventy five. So we write the SQL query as a string, like normal, and then we execute it on the cursor. And this fetch all command is how we get the data back from SQLite 3 and into Python. So DB info is then uh, an iterable list of all of our information that, so essentially star. And so for each entry in DB info, we want to print it, and this is what it looks like. And at the end, we commit and close our connection. Oh, uh, so I, I believe that's more important if you were actually doing insertions and, and changing data. Uh, you're, in this case, we're not. But just get into the habit of, of doing both those things when you're done with you can the data. Sort of a, uh, a temporary holding area for all the stuff you do until you commit. So um, if you're adding a whole bunch of data, you can essentially add it into the storage area and then do a commit, and it does it all much more quickly than if you just constantly commit it. it that's also part of the transaction, um, so that if you had an error that happened inside of all of what you do here, let's say you had a try accept statement and you, you bark. Um, uh, if you haven't committed, it won't actually um, uh, corrupt the database. Oh, because we didn't want to close it out yet. Uh, so if we go up here, uh, I didn't commit it because I wanted to continue to access the. Um, it, it's all it's all the same interpreter session. If I had done that, I'd have to start over again from the beginning. If that makes. Anyway, so here is the full database, and then to signify what we queried, I just box it. And that's the, that's the information that we got out. Okay. Can you make more than one cursor per connection? I have not tried to do that. Sorry, what was the question? question is, can you make more than one cursor per connection? Uh, yes, you can. But I don't know what the benefit well, of that would necessarily be. Well, if you were doing some threaded operation, oh, okay. you could have multiple threads, there you, you go. could have multiple cursors pointing at the same database. This is part of this concurrency. In SQLite 3, this is not recommended because it's quite easy to um, SQLite 3 is not managing transactions for you very gracefully. And so if you have multiple cursors all trying to write stuff in, uh, reading is fine, right? If you get multiple cursors if you're just in reading, but you generally don't want to have more than one cursor writing. If you had uh, MySQL or Postgres as your back engine, um, it would handle things a little bit more gracefully. But I, I wouldn't do it. So what exactly is a cursor? Why is it called a cursor relative? Um, like what's the difference? Yeah, in some sense, I think of it as like a session. When you open up a connection, you're basically session. getting access to that database. And then I think of cursors as sessions uh, on, that on, on that connection. And so you can have a whole bunch of things that one cursor has done and not committed, and a whole bunch of things that another cursor has done and not committed. And now if I bring in a third cursor, and I ask 
and they try to pull over the data, that won't be in the database. Until one cursor commits and say adds a whole bunch of rows, none of the other sessions will see that. So, I mean, in the concept of like uh, versioning, you have Git where you're like, you know, sort of committing to your local system and then you do a push that's the equivalent of a, of a commit here where you're actually saying now the, the, the central server has, uh, has knowledge of what I've done. But it's sort of a state, I think of it as a staging area. So to enable us to do joins, we're going to create another table in our example database. And so this whole slide is just going to be a block of uh, a block of Python text, but you can follow along in the notebook. And then on the next slide, I'll show you what it all looks like graphically. This concept will wind up persisting over, the concept of the cursor persists over almost all database management systems, so getting comfortable with that idea is fine, except with other database management systems, it actually, you generally don't get into as much trouble. Okay, so this first slide should be, uh, this first slide of this uh, process of creating another table and then running the join should be uh, just building up on what we did previously, just inserting uh, different data. So we're going to create uh, essentially almost identical table for Jane Curtin. We're just calling it Jane Curtin. And it has the same um, columns, although this, this is not necessary, but in this example it just worked out to be that way. And then we're going to insert three skits for her in the same way. And then this last uh, entry here, this SQL command for select Dan Ecker, that's get title, Dan Ecker, that air date, et cetera, this is where we're going to do the uh, join. So the syntax is that we're going to select from, uh, well, basically the, the operation we want to do is we want to know all of the skits which featured both Dan Aykroyd and Jane Curtin, and we want to know the roles that they both played. So we're selecting from Dan Aykroyd the skit title and from Dan Aykroyd the air date and the season and the episode and Dan Aykroyd's role. And from Jane Curtin, we want her role. And you know, everything except for the roles are going to be shared across both tables. So it doesn't really matter whether we pull it from Dan Aykroyd or Jane Curtin for air date, skit title, episode, or season. Oh, and this, this dot episode, this should be dot EP here. I'm sorry. Um, I think it's fixed in the notebook, though. And then we want to go from Dan Aykroyd and comma Jane Curtin. So we're saying select all of this information from both tables, table Dan Aykroyd and table Jane Curtin, where, and this is the important part of this, this is a more simple type of join on columns, where Dan Aykroyd.skit title equals Jane Curtin.skit title. So we're saying where these two things match and where the air dates match for both tables. So it's possible, for example, that the Coneheads makes multiple appearances since it was such a popular skit, and it's always titled just the Coneheads, or the Coneheads at home, or whatever it is. But uh, maybe Jane Curtin was sick that day, and somebody else covered for her. We want to know whether the air date was the same. So if both the air date and the skit title are the same, then they must have appeared uh, in the skit together. And then we run the print. And we get the Coneheads at home, which is the one uh, skit uh, that they were both in where, uh, I guess, Dan Aykroyd was Beldar and Jane was pre -mat. And so here is uh, a graphical representation of this simple join on columns. So this is our database with all the data in it, with tables Dan Aykroyd and Jane Curtin. And we're going to ask where 
uh, danacroyd.skittitle equals janecurtain.skittitle and danacroyd.airdate equals janecurtain.airdate, where are these the same? And here I highlight in orange the one entry in both tables where these conditions are satisfied. And then the red box outlines all the data that is fetched. So the select arguments, which is going to be, or which was, Dan Aykroyd's skit title, air date, season episode, and role, and Jane Curtin's role. All right. So that's one of the simple ways to run a join. And it's, I think, one of the easier just kind of wrap your head around because it's more explicit in what it's saying, the column information you want to kind of merge these tables on. A left join is another way of doing this. And we're going to, I mean, I, I say this just because, uh, for example, I, I don't want to have to reopen the database. Uh, the new SQL command is this, where we're going to say select uh, the same information as before. So this is the skit title, air date, season, episode, and role from Dan Aykroyd, as well as the role from Jane Curtin. And we're going to do it from, and then from Dan Aykroyd all the way through Jane Curtin here. This can be kind of thought of as like a new table, where Dan Aykroyd left join Jane Curtin is sort of like the new table. We're creating, through this left join, a joined table, where it has both information from Dan Aykroyd and Jane Curtin. And we're going to select from this table on the requirements that Dan Aykroyd.skit title equals Jane Curtin.skit title and Dan Aykroyd.airdate equals Jane Curtin.airdate. The same uh, requirements as before. And fetch all the data and then print it. But this time it's going to be a little bit different. And I'll, I'll show this graphically on the next slide. So if we imagine this is the Dan Aykroyd table and this is the Jane Curtin table, a left join is sort of like we take the Jane Curtin uh, table and overlay it on the Dan Aykroyd table, and we see what information matches. And in this case, uh, the first two don't match because they've got different uh, skit titles and different air dates. But the third, the Coneheads at Home, does. And the information that we get out of that is the information that we care about. So the left join table is taking the Dan Aykroyd table, and it's taking all the information there, and it's saying, if the skit title, the air date, match, I want you to input Jane Curtin's role and create this left join title, a table. If they don't match, Jane Curtin's role is none. And that results with our, our final answer was, of course, uh, the third one in the join table. Sorry. Which is the same result we got before. We're essentially running the same query just through a left join or a simple join on columns. So is there any questions about joins in SQLite 3? Why do you do it that way as opposed to the previous way? Oh, it's just a different way of doing it in this case. Uh, sometimes it can be more efficient if your data lends itself to that case. So let's take a look at the. Here are the joins. So why would you do a left join versus uh, a join on columns? A left join allows you to not have to specify the columns quite the same, right? So from left join. And I think it's a little bit uh, less taxing on the memory resources. Uh, so whereas. Uh, in the simple join, the first one we did, you basically have to scan through everything. And you have to, it has to ingest all of both tables. Whereas in the left join, it just kind of smushes them together. And if there is data, it matches and you get the full row. If there's no data for Jane Curtin, you just get a none. So uh, they produce somewhat different outputs. But when we do the where, where we require that skit title is the same and air date is the same. We're taking all of the information that could be returned, and we're only saying we only care about this and this smaller single skit. And that skit happens to be the same from both these queries. But had we not used this uh, same 
uh, specifications here, it would have returned uh, the three row table, which is mostly Dan Aykroyd, and then none for the first two entries for Jane Curtin. So we could have done, we could have asked on that, where does Jane Curtin not have a role? And it would have been everything the same except for, uh, I guess, on Jane Curtin dot role equals none from this table. So the way I think about that, the way I think about joins is you only get results back if there is a match on both the left table and the right table. But if you do a left join, you're always guaranteed to get back everything from the left table. And and if you wind up getting a match from the right table, you get that information That's good, as yeah. well. If not, you get a none. So if you want all the information from table one, and you also want to append other information from the from table two, you do a left join. Likewise, you can do a right join. So only get stuff from table two. And there's left outer join. So does it output a new table? Or is it just a it's virtual, like, well, it doesn't, a virtual table like a that's, view. that yeah. is in memory for the moment that you uh, get back the result? You can save um, temporary, there's a concept of a temporary table um, that you can name. So for your entire session, you could save a temporary table of the result of my crazy query. And then you could start querying that table. And then as soon as you close your connection, that, that temporary table gets destroyed. So you can actually, if you don't want to have a table, let's say we don't want to know about Jane Curtin anymore, we can drop that table and we just say drop table name. But I've never named the table. Well, we named it Jane Curtin. I mean, realistically, if you were going to do this in a, a better database sense, you'd have one table called actors, another table called skits, and you would do the, the joins that way. Calling a table after the actor name is sort of silly. Right? Well, for the purpose of what you're unless you're Dan Aykroyd and you're, I mean, all you care about is Dan Aykroyd. The purpose of what you're trying to illustrate is just fine. But it's not great database architecture. Uh, so the next uh, example before we get to the breakout is how we can do plotting and specifically why it's advantageous to do plotting using a database for some types of, of problems. And so everything is in the uh, notebook for this. So this first block is just going to load up the things we're going to need. We're actually going to be pulling over uh, data from finance.yahoo.com uh, for stocks. And so we're defining this function, which is just get stock data, where it's essentially just a urlib2 call to download the data for a stock symbol, and then uh, creating a file um, to save the data into and then loading it in and returning the uh, array with that data in it. So everything in this function should have been familiar to everybody. Uh, so I'll move on. This is an example of what that table looks like, uh, or the data file, what the data file looks like. Uh, each uh, stock symbol has has uh, a, a very long list of open dates, uh, dates that the stock was open for trade, and then its open value, the high value during the day, the low value, the close at the end of the day, the volume, and this adjusted close value. And then it goes on from, from actually the day that you downloaded it, so it might be up to date to today, down all the way through 2000, February 1st, because that's when Yahoo started doing this stuff. Okay. So the way we're going to use this function is we're going to create a database with all the stock information. And uh, the first line here is how we create a database in RAM. So instead of specifying a file, just give it the string colon memory colon. And this will tell SQLite 3 to create the database in RAM. And for things like this plotting example, where you're actually storing all the, the data is going to be stored in files on your computer called, uh, for example, uh, vz.txt, where vz is Verizon, and that's the stock symbol. When you run it, it'll create that file, and it'll store it in your local directory. So you have all the data in human-readable format, just as these text files, but you're also going to load it into the database so that we can take advantage of the queries that the database provides. 
So create a table stocks in our database in memory where we're going to create a column for each one of the columns in the uh, data files. So there'll be uh, uh, a primary key auto increment ID, which is just as normal, and then uh, the stock symbol, the day, which will be an int, because for the purposes of this example, I'm just converting uh, days into integers so that when we plot it, um, it's a little bit smoother. We don't have to worry about date time objects. Uh, the open value, the high value, the low value, the close value, the volume, and then the adjusted close. All is floats because they're decimal uh, data. Then we execute the command to create that table. And then for each uh, company that we're interested in, in this case uh, Verizon, Apple, Ford, Microsoft, and Bank of America, we create uh, an entry in the stock symbols list. And if you wanted to, you could modify this as you wish to track whatever stocks you care about. I just pick some popular ones, I guess. And uh, we're creating a reference date, which is going to be where we're going to be incrementing the integer of the day from. So when we end up plotting this data, it will be number of days from January 1st, 2000, just to simplify the way that we're plotting it. So for each uh, company and stock symbols, essentially, we're going to call get stock data, which, as we recall, returns uh, an array of the data. And then for each row in the data, we're going to have a SQL command to enter that row into our table. So here we're just building up the database table with all of the stock information that we download when we run get stock data. So I'm going to run this, and this will take uh, just about five seconds because it has to download all that stuff. And there, it's done. So if you do that as well, you will then have populated in your working directory uh, files like this. So this is Apple, Bank of America, Ford. We just downloaded and parsed and loaded those into uh, NumPy arrays. And then the last step is going to be plotting. And this is hopefully where you can see how the database uh, provides a little bit of advantage over if you were to do this just with straight uh, Python and well, NumPy for the um, parsing of the tables. So for each uh, symbol and stock symbols, we're going to create a query where we select the day and the close from the table stocks where the symbol is the one that we're caring about. And then we execute that and we get back a list. And it is super simple to slice into that and plot it up. So we call it an array so we can do the slicing. And then uh, we slice on the zero column or the first column and that will give us the day. And the second slice, the slice on the second column will give us the closing value. And then we can just plot it up, label it with SS, and that's all we have to do for each stock symbol. Uh, just to add some, these last four lines are just uh, to make the plot look nice and to put the legend in a decent location. Oh. Well, let's try six and five. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Well, I got in the habit of being. Anyway, there it is. And so the advantage of this is that we could use the database to do the query on our stock sum. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Uh, and you're going to see this in the breakout that you're going to encounter uh, shortly, is that you can use the database to effectively uh, enforce like a logic statement that you would normally do in Python. So if we had, instead of a database, just a huge uh, list or array where each row in the database was a row in our list or array, we would have to say if uh, entry whatever for the stock symbol equals the stock symbol we care about, plot that single row's point and make the color this. Instead, we can use the database to do a query only on that stock symbol, get essentially a whole array or a list that we convert into an array of the information we want to plot, and we can plot it all at once. So that allows us to uh, save a lot of time 
and computation power in plotting individual points for individual rows if we wanted to be fancy with our coloring and manipulations in the visualization. OK. So is there any questions on this example? Cool. And I believe, yeah, here it is. This is the same thing as I had before. And you can, you can also play around and, and plot other things than just the closing value. You can plot the volume, for example, which I think Microsoft, its volume is a, is a very different type of pattern to it than, than this does. And you can see that. It's kind of cool. OK. So next couple of slides, next few slides, I'll be talking about the MySQL and PostgreSQL before the breakout. So MySQL is, uh, MySQL DB is the <coughs> module for Python which allows you easy access into a MySQL database. And it supports, uh, the main difference is, is that it's uh, thread compatible as well as SQLite, but it is safer to use because the MySQL server uh, is in charge of making sure that it's not concurrently writing into the same blocks in the database. And so it is, uh, has better checks and fail safes on to preventing data corruption in that sense. It also has uh, a user password permission system built into the server so that if multiple people are sharing uh, the MySQL database, in Python, you have to provide a username and password, and it knows what you're able to do, what tables you can query, what tables you can insert into, and so that you can, if you are the administrator of the database, have uh, protection and kind of like uh, read permission set uh, if you're sharing it with other people. Uh, it is not built in with Python. You have to download it yourself. Uh, you also, to be able to use it, have to have MySQL on your system. Although I suppose if you are connecting to a MySQL database that is not locally hosted, which is, uh, one, of the, which is one of the more common use cases, you don't have to have MySQL installed locally. Uh, but if you want to test and develop with it, it you should probably get it from the uh, SourceForge page. Uh, and uh, just a, a, a word of caution, it's possible, but it's, it's sometimes a little bit tricky to get MySQL installed on just a normal consumer laptop. Most of the syntax is similar. One thing that's different, though, um, and I was reminded when Josh was using the glob command in previous examples, is in SQLite 3, an asterisk is the wildcard. That is not the same in MySQL syntax. So I believe it's uh, percent sign, and there's another one. But just be aware that stuff like that can change. And so look those up and know when you're working with it in a specific database language which one to use. Uh, this is just a very small blob to show you how to, how to get started uh, with MySQL DB. Uh, just import it. And then this MySQL DB.connect. Oh, I lost my cursor again. But that's uh, how you would connect to the database. And you have to provide it a, the host. And so where it's, uh, you, you would give it an IP address there, for example, um, or localhost if it's local. And then you give it a username and a password and which database on the host you want to connect into. Because a MySQL database server can have multiple databases, each with multiple tables exposed in it. And a connection timeout, just because MySQL DB will often, as I said, allow you to access uh, MySQL servers that are not local. And uh, oftentimes, if the connection is broken or something, you want the failsafe to know to exit out of your connection if uh, the timeout occurs. And then after that, this uh, cursor uh, syntax and the SQL syntax is pretty much the same. Just uh, connect the cursor. And then you can execute queries and use fetch all to get back your data. Uh, what's kind of nice is that MySQL DB goes through the trouble of translating data types from the MySQL uh, syntax essentially into Python data types. So if there was a date in MySQL and you retrieved it, MySQL DB would form it in, in this case, this DB info object. And this, it's a list. But it, it, it would create the proper date time Pythonic object in that list. 
to represent the data you got back from the database. And so that's also if you had, for example, um, a float versus a string versus an integer, MySQL DB would try to intelligently translate the data types from MySQL data types to Python data types. Yes. Okay. And then this slide is just to say that there's also PyGreSQL and many different others um, to use with different types of database servers and management systems. Uh, I'm only ever, I've only ever gotten familiar with MySQL DB, uh, but if there's a problem, there's probably a solution already out there for it in Python. All right, so let's move on to the breakout exercise. I have provided for you in your lecture uh, files, your download, uh, world.txt and a stationslist.txt. So world.txt is a series of lines to create polygons, which will create kind of a crude Mercator projection map of the world. And then stationslist.txt uh, is a large list of seismograph stations located on latitude and longitude in the world. And then I want you to plot up what the world looks like just from the polygons. And then import the stationslist.txt data into a database uh, locally with SQLite 3 and plot the stations on top of the world map, their locations in latitude and longitude. But I want you to use different colors for open, reserved, and closed stations. There's a column in stationslist.txt where it says the status of the station, where it can be open, reserved, or closed. And I want you to use queries, uh, for example, where status equals reserved, uh, pull out an array or a list, which will turn into an array, and then can plot all as one color, all with the same parameters for alpha values or symbol sizes and things like that, instead of doing a really uh, inefficient for loop and logic test combination. For extra credit, there's also station elevation. So you, why don't you try and colorize the open stations based on station elevation? Uh, and that should be for those who get it done quickly. So. Go ahead, and I'll be here to answer questions. I've provided breakout solutions, again, in a notebook, but don't look at it. I'm sure you, and you know the drill. Look at it when we're done, and I'll show you the answers uh, when we get back from the break.
KCDs, it, now that you know databases, and when you create tables, you can also drop tables. First thing says, hi, this is your son's school. We're having some computer trouble. Oh, dear, did he break something? In a way, did you really name your son Robert Drop Table Student? <laughs> oh, yes, little Bobby Tables, we call him. Well, we've lost this year's student records. Hope you're happy. And I hope you've learned to sanitize your database inputs. Um, this is, uh, you know, obviously we've been sort of presenting to you kind of anesthetized data where it's not actually malicious, but you can imagine executing SQL um, inputs where you actually construct some malicious piece of string. Um, many of the databases and the database uh, management systems will try to protect against that. Um, and the Python APIs also give you a way of sending essentially sanitized data um, when you do inserts. Um, so if you are really care about this, um, which probably uh, some of you will, um, you'll have to get to know uh, some of the details of uh, essentially the security of a database. Now more than security, more of the integrity of, um, of databases. Um, one of the powers, other than what, what Chris was just telling you about with SQLite 3, one of the powers of uh, coercing your data into a database, first of all, is that it makes you think about the structure of your data ahead of time. Um, and it allows you, um, as you get data from all over, all over the place, perhaps heterogeneous data, it allows you to think about having to coerce that into a more regularized form so that when you do your analytics on that data, you've got um, essentially already a sanitized version of that data. So that's one great thing about databasing large amounts of your data. The other thing, of course, which you don't get from SQLite 3 is the fact that perhaps those stations are being opened and closed and maybe somebody in a research group that you're collaborating with is in charge of monitoring what stations are being opened and closed, and they're writing into a MySQL database that both of you are, um, have access to. They're dealing with that, but your job is to do analytics on that on a daily basis so that database could constantly be updating. So it's the fact that you can share data across platforms because your collaborator who might be in Europe might be using a completely different interface. It could be using a web-based interface to that database, a uh, command line interface. They might have some sort of JavaScript thing that they're doing to interact with the data. You don't really care where the data came from. If you guys are all sharing that database, um, then that's, um, that's really one of the big powers of it all. The thing I do like about SQLite 3, of course, is that you can make that database and you can, instead of writing it into memory, which then gets destroyed as soon as you close your session, you can save it into a file and then you could actually send it to your friend and say, here's my little Python code that makes this, um, that makes this nice little uh, plot of, of, the, uh, of, of the world and here's the database that goes along with it. So you essentially hand them a file which is the database, because it's SQLite 3, and it's essentially just a single file, something .db. And then the Python script, you hand them those two, they can completely reproduce what it is that you've done. Whereas if you have a bunch of different text files all over the place, and you have a big tarball, and you give it to them, if they're not able to coerce the data in the same way that you, you've coerced the data, they're not able to produce what you've done. So um, it's worth spending time getting to know SQLite 3 as the module um, in Python that interacts with SQLite 3. Um, but one of the things that I think you're going to want to start doing if you are dealing with lots of data on a daily basis is start playing with something called SQL Alchemy, which is a so-called object relational mapper. And what this does is it abstracts the peculiarities of a given um, database management system so that when you're interacting with that data in Python, you see it as a consistent view. So at some level, it means that it doesn't matter whether you have SQLite 3 under the hood or whether you have MySQL or Oracle or Postgres or what have you. Um, SQL Alchemy allows you to essentially write Python code where you're now viewing uh, the, the data in the database as essentially Pythonic objects. All of the different APIs are effectively letting you do that, but they all have their own peculiarities. And when you want to issue an SQL query, like in SQLite 3, you have to literally write a string, which is the SQL query, which you then execute. But in SQL Alchemy, what you wind up doing is you wind up sort of doing joins on objects, um, for instance. And if you want to do sorting, you're sorting on objects, which under the hood 
is effectively doing that query. But what S SQL Alchemy has done for you is it allows you to um, interact with all of these different uh, databases that I've listed up here um, in a coherent fashion. And that is, that is really nice. Because one day you may realize, I don't want to just have a local file called um, something.db. I want to start now interacting with uh, a database that lives in a national supercomputing center or something, right? And so you wouldn't, allow, you wouldn't have to change your code at all. I've, I've been through the pain enough times to tell you that I've written code that just does SQLite 3, and then someone's like, yeah, but now it doesn't scale. Now we have to do distributed, and then I try to do like, you know, uh, I don't know, SQL or whatever, and, and uh, a different um, database management system like Postgres, and all of a sudden you're spending all your time dealing with the peculiarities of the different SQL queries that you would make um, and the different slight constructions of the creation of those different tables um, in those different databases. And that's incredibly painful. If I had done this with SQL Alchemy, it would all be OK. okay? So um, if, you're, if you're really serious about uh, uh, doing scientific programming, um, you should really give some great thought to SQL Alchemy. We didn't get you up to speed on that because it's a bit more of an, abstract, uh, an abstraction away from SQL than, than I think you uh, kind of need to know. Um, but it's, it's worth spending some time with it. OK, so we're going to change courses a little bit and um, talk about uh, a different way of, of thinking about databases in some sense than a relational database. Um, this, is in, this is sort of akin to what SQLite is, where you've got a single file on disk somewhere. Um, now where it's not storing a relational database, but now where you're going to wind up storing a hierarchical database. Um, and uh, one of the nice websites you can go to, which is um, maintained uh, up at NERSC at LBL, is uh, from um, the Scientific Computing Center. And they have sort of a consistent snapshot of what people are actually using in the, in the scientific um, um, computing world for data management. And they have this um, statement, uh, there is no common scientific data format that is used across all scientific disciplines. For instance, NetCDF is commonly used in climate modeling. FITS is preferred for storing astronomy data. Well, HDF5 is used, for instance, in the combination and fusion simulation communities. So when you're talking about transport of large data, so I can hand you some like 100 megabyte file that has a lot of data that you and I are going to want to perhaps talk about and interact over, um, generally we wind up getting into domain specific data formats. SQLite 3 is great because I can just hand you uh, a file. But what's very clear is that SQLite 3 is not a great way to be transporting binary images. So if I have a bunch of 2K by 2K images, and I want to put them all together into one file and hand them to you, I probably should just do it as a tarball. But if I want to somehow do it as a self-contained unit, SQLite 3 is not the way to do it. You want to do it with some of these other um, different file formats. And these are all essentially hierarchical. Um, and this gets back to the view of a hierarchical database that we had before. Um, so. Um, there is a C-based uh, API um, database that was uh, developed um, by NCSA um, that uh, is a file format, essentially a standard called HDF5, um, that allows us to see our data in a hierarchical way. And when we think hierarchical, one way to think about it is essentially either as a document structure. So um, if you want to think about it as like an XML file or a JSON string, where, or a Python dictionary, where you've got keywords, values, and then you might have more dictionaries inside of that. That sort of nested sense is hierarchical. Or if I want to think of it as a you know, slash on my um, Unix uh, computer, that's essentially the top level directory of, um, of what I have on my, uh, on my disk. And then I go to slash users, and I get my user accounts. That is hierarchical. And what's nice is that um, this uh, database, which is essentially a file, you interact with the data inside of that database as if it was part of a file system. Um, so there are two types of objects in HDF5. Um, there's the multidimensional um, homogeneous arrays, and, which can have attributes associated with them, uh, tables. And these are essentially record-like uh, arrays um, in NumPy, um, and then uh, something called an array. And then there are groups. And these are containers that hold data sets and other groups, like folders. 
So you think of groups as essentially a, a directory. So you can tra traverse through a bunch of different groups. And then finally, you get to the stuff that you want to deal with. It's the data sets. Um, and I'll show you some examples of that in just a bit. So the really nice things about HDF5, one, is it's very portable. Unlike if I hand you some pickle file um, and somebody doesn't have Python, they don't know how to interact with Python, they're completely hosed. But HDF5 is a standard and where there are API plugins essentially across all different languages. So you could hand somebody an HDF5 file and they would know what to do with it because um, it's self-describing. It has the metadata at each different node, um, at each different group, to describe what's going to be um, in, the, um, in, in, that, in, that, uh, in that group. Um, the other thing is it's hugely scalable, so it's essentially as big as you can make files, and you can move them around. Um, and uh, you can even think about having a single HDF file, which is a conceptual one, but it's actually physically many different files. And they're all connected to each other essentially just with pointers, where you can say, actually, to go farther down into this group, you want to point to another HDF file, which lives somewhere else. Because everything inside of the HDF file is considered essentially what you think of as a, as a directory. Why not, when you get to the endpoint, just point to another directory in another part of the file system? And because file systems can be made as viewed by these different um, uh, APIs, can be made to look like they're actually on a common platform, even though they're distributed across the, the net, um, all of this stuff can just sort of run in a very massively parallel um, environment. And the other issue, uh, which I didn't mention, um, is the Endian issue, which is a big one, of course, with pickles. Um, but uh, essentially, the file is self-describing. So it says, what you're about to see is in little Endian format. And so whenever there's an API that is working on a computer system that's natively not little Endian, it will know that it has to switch things around. Um, so there's a. An, an, a very nice uh, third-party module called PyTables, which is the Pythonic API of HDF5. And there is a, another um, competing version of this, both of which I think come with the nThought distribution. Um, these are very mature. And in fact, they're sort of companies. Uh, one company is built on top of uh, PyTables, where they have sort of an enterprise version of it. But it's open source, and um, it's, quite, it's quite powerful. And you know it's it's also built on top of NumPy, so that when you're pulling over and dealing with arrays, you're basically seeing them and viewing them and able to slice them up as if they were NumPy arrays. Um, and it works on compressed data files. So there is a concept within HDF5 of compressed data, so that when you're writing in a huge chunk of data into this file, you can actually set the compression level, um, which is really nice. OK, so here's. Um, sort of a structure of uh, an HDF5 file. If I say tables.openfile, um, effectively what I'm getting is the, is the root. And if I want to now create a group, and there are attributes are about, that, uh, uh, about that root. So these are essentially, this is essentially the metadata about the root. It's saying, when you do it at the root level, how is the data compressed? Um, does there, is there any sort of... Um, uh, sort of hash checking on this. So you can do an MD5 sum uh, checking on all the data inside of it, um, et cetera. I can create data sets. So I can just create a group, and I'll call it data sets. And inside of that, I can create arrays. Um, and I can have uh, tables in there as well. And I can create links, et cetera. It takes some uh, use to, you know, you actually have to play with this to get used to it, but it's, um, it becomes pretty intuitive uh, uh, pretty quickly. The, th the thing to note about arrays is unlike NumPy arrays, these things can be extended. So if you now want to think about this as sort of a, in a row um, database sense, I can just start adding and, and extending and appending more and more rows onto this data, and, and um, it's, it's totally fine within the HDF5 uh, framework. All right, so let me go to the notebook, which you have, uh, I think, already. It's called HDF5. And we'll just step through the creation of, uh, of one of these um, file systems within HDF5. Um, so I'll import NumPy, um, import um, tables. So I'll just grab everything just to make things easier. 
and I'll get an HDF5 file, which is basically just an open file pointing to an HDF5 um, uh, um, a file type. Say open file. I'll create something called spam.h5 in write mode, and I'll give it a, a, a title, which is part of the metadata. And I'm going to print out an h5 file. It tells me it's a file, what the file name is, what the title is, what the mode is, some other information. In particular, this, um, this filters is pretty interesting. Let's see. I think I could do this. Uh, this filters is pretty interesting because it's telling us at the root level when I start shoving data in, how should that data be handled? So I have some sort of concept of a compression level. This thing Fletcher 32, setting it to false says don't do um, uh, don't do uh, checksums on the data. Uh, you can go in the documentation to see what all these other different things are. Obviously, if I set checksums to be true, I could do it up here. And then when I start writing in data, it's going to be a little bit slower. And when I start pulling out data, it's going to be slower because it's, it's actually one way of sort of making sure that the file doesn't get corrupted and the data inside of it doesn't get corrupted. And I've got a root group associated with this. Um, OK. So um, yeah, and I said a little bit in here about what these different filters are. Now let's create a 100 by 100 random image with the create array and associate it with a group called data sets. So we'll say we've got this thing called data sets, which is a new group. So essentially think of this as making a new directory. Um, and it will have as its root the, um, the root of, the, uh, of this file. I'll call it data sets. And I'll give it a title, um, test data sets. And then um, I'll do a create array, uh, which will be created inside of data sets. I'll call this thing data set one. And I'll just make a 100 by 100 um, random image. OK. So you can see some of the information about the byte ordering. This is the Endian ordering. What flavor is this in? It, it recognized this was a NumPy array. Um, now let's, inside of data sets, uh, we'll, create, um, we'll create some complex uh, structure. We'll create a particle. Um, which will be basically uh, um, will be actually the sort of file format of um, inside of a table. So effectively, we're going to create uh, a table that will have rows, and these rows will have sort of a com will have a complex understanding of what is in each row. Particle, because I'm thinking of sort of atomic mass stuff. I've got a name of the particle, what the atomic number is, what the mass is just randomly saying something about pressure. And you notice these things can be of different sizes. I can say that inside, I want this thing to be in position one, position two, position three, so that I'm sort of saying this is column one, this is column two, this is column three. Here, I didn't say which column it is. I could have called it column five, and then later on said I, have, I want to have something in position uh, four. Um, we don't have a lot of time to go into the details of, of how you do this, but essentially what I'm doing is I'm creating a table, and it's going to have uh, this uh, sort of complex notion of a particle. OK, um, now I'll just point to uh, this um, table row. I'll print out what this row is. So I'm pointing to the first row of this, uh, of this table. And now I'm going to add some data here. So I'll say row name is equal to oxygen, atomic number eight, mass is this, pressure is some uh, two by three uh, vector. And I'll append this row onto this table. So this is where we start diverging from the concept of a NumPy array, where I wouldn't be able to append onto that. I'd have to do some sort of fancy slicing and dicing and make essentially a new array in memory. Um, so let me do that. And I'm actually now going to get back what that, that first particle is, that essentially that first row. And there's my answer. So now I'll get another row, and I'll add some more data to this. And you don't have to do it in this way. You can obviously loop through if you had a big data set and you wanted to fill all this stuff up. Name Kleinium, atomic number 150, mass 360. And now I've got two different um, particles inside of this table, which is inside of a group called data sets. Now I can do some list comprehension, where effectively I'm doing some searching 
over this data. This is why we think of this as a data set. And you notice I'm essentially going to do what looks like a where statement, but I'm now going to do this in a string sense because this is all being done by the, by the API, um, where the atomic number is greater than 5 and the mass is less than 100. And I get back oxygen. So I can search through this data. And what I haven't told you about is how you actually would index some of these things. So if you wanted to merge uh, across multiple tables, you could do that as well. Any questions about what I did? The nice thing is I've now got a file called spam.h5. And I can send that by email to you or put it on an FTP site. You can grab it um, or Dropbox. And there are different ways to look at this data. Um, there are some nice graphical interfaces uh, to HDF5 files. Um, I've made reference to that in, um, uh, in the lecture notes I'll show you in a second. Here I've just uh, opened up um, spam.h5. And you can see the structure of this file. right? So it looks basically like I've just handed you an entire directory that's got lots of information in it. And I've got something called data sets. And I can see the information and the metadata about that data set. Um, and then I've got this, uh, well, a 64-bit floating point array of size 100 by 100. It's got a number of attributes associated with it. Um, and I can visualize that. And that's what I've done over here. Um, I can see this data in this way. I think if I. I can open this as, instead of looking at it as an image, I can open it as a spreadsheet. I can see it, see it as a zero-based or one-based. Um, so now I can look at the data inside of that. This looks too much like Excel to me, so I will close it. And you know what you basically have is a little um, palette over here where you're actually able to look at the, let's see, I want to open. I don't know where it's throwing that. It's throwing that table somewhere. Oh, it's throwing that table. Huh. I don't know why it's not letting me look at that. Let me try open again. Where's the data set? Where's the particles? Huh. I don't know why it's not showing me the particles. Well, it should be showing me a similar table for what these particles are. I'm um, not quite sure why it's not. Because it's got two data points in it. You try it down. Yeah. Ah, OK. So you have to play around with the, with the view of it. I uh, was curious how it would handle the pressure. Yeah, that's a good point. Maybe if I just do this. Yeah, it shows all that. Uh, it's weird, because I opened it up last night, and it was showing me that as sort of a, um, it, it knew how to display the sort of nested arrays. Anyway, so you can interact with this data. And in fact, if we wanted to, we could even create, um, we could even create some more nodes on this. I think I opened this up in read-only mode. Uh, yeah, you can actually get some. Uh, some versions of these viewers that will allow you to then create more data sets um, and more groups. Um, anyway, so that's, that's kind of cute. Um, and interestingly, on March 10th, what's today, the 5th? 5th. Yeah. So in a couple of days, the end of the week, there will be a talk on this at, uh, at PyCon, um, Python AHDF5, fast storage for large data. Um, so this is certainly a very hot topic um, in the Python community. Uh, NetCDF4 is another hierarchical data format, uh, primarily used in climate modeling. For those climate modelers out there and climate deniers, you're probably using NetCDF4. Um, uh, open, uh, what? Deniers? Don't some people deny that there is even a climate? Um, sorry for those listening on the web. Uh, OK, um, so there's another service, which is called OpenEndApp, 
which um, is essentially a protocol for accessing large amounts of data across the web. Um, I won't have a lot of time to go into that either, but that's actually quite interesting. Say you and your group are working with terabytes of data, and you want to sort of get a small slice of that data. You want to query on that data, let's say, and pull back a small part of it. Um, if you have a server which is serving uh, uh, certain data sets with this open NDAP platform, you can connect with um, a bunch of different Pythonic modules. There's a NetCDF4, for instance, that allows you to essentially connect to that data set and then, say, slice it and do a where statement on it. And instead of pulling back the terabyte data set, you only get back the pieces that you actually need. So you can be interacting with huge data sets uh, uh, remotely. Um, there's a lot of things now that you're very excited about databases and you're completely comfortable with the idea that if you've got lots of, lots of data and heterogeneous data, there's uh, something out there for you in the Pythonic community. There's a lot of different things you can do um, in terms of working with distributed database, databases. Um, there's something called HBase, which is built on top of um, Hadoop. Um, more interestingly, I think for the Python community are these column store databases. The big one that the Python community is using is something called MonetDB, um, and that uses a concept of um, column stores rather than row stores. Allows you to do very simple problems called MapReduce problems that are sort of very easily scalable across multiple nodes. Um, and then there's uh, SciDB, which is an up and comer in the scientific computing um, database world. And now what they've done is they've they've recognized that a we've got a tremendous tremendously large amounts of data. Um, B, uh, that data probably needs to be distributed over multiple nodes where there's a lot of computing power on each of those nodes. And C, we actually probably want to do some high level manipulation and computation on the data in the database itself. So SciDB is, um, is growing, it's open source, there's Python APIs, and it views itself essentially as a platform that is a distributed platform it's a database that is it's, it's a distributed um, data management platform, and it's sort of a computational engine. So you can do things like cross-correlate two fast Fourier transforms, and you do that at the SQL level. Um, and if you don't have something like fast Fourier transform, uh, you can just write it in Python and then embed it in the database, and then you can do very, very complex queries on the data. And it does it in an intelligent way because it, it is um, at the very base level how the data is physically stored and how it's physically accessed is kind of a, is quite different than the way that um, other data uh, uh, is stored in other database management systems. So if you really want to sort of start working on the bleeding edge, um, take a look at SciDB. There are Python APIs, um, and I think there's a new release coming out in about nine days or so. Um, and it uh, seems to be well-funded and well-liked by the sort of massive data systems um, in, this, in the scientific uh, um, community. So I think with that, um, we'll end our database uh, session within Python. Um, just close with our XKCD again. And um, I guess we should show you the uh, homework. So we think the homework's going to be fun. Again, you know, we have um, one, of our, one of our small issues here is that we're trying to do scientific programming within Python, but we're also trying not to make it too domain specific. So something that's dealing with lots of data where you're ask, able to ask high level questions. Um, we've, I guess we've appealed to sports and now we're appealing to election. Well, before we were dealing with bear populations. Now we're gonna do the elections. So in this assignment, you're gonna create a database to analyze event prediction data pertaining to three ongoing elections, in particular the Republican presidential nominee election, well, nomination, uh, 2012 presidential election, and the vice presidential um, nominee. So what we'll ask you to do is create a database which, uh, that has a table called races, populate each uh, race name, election date, um, URLs as we show be below. There is a a trading market called Intrade. For those of you that haven't played with that, that's kind of interesting. You can basically trade off of lots of different types of possible events, like possibility that we're going to bomb a country in the Middle East by December 31st, 2012, 
that has a dollar of value associated with it. And essentially, you have um, prices going from zero to ten dollars, and you can buy and sell stock essentially at any one of these values. Every single event um, has an associated value with it. And uh, the idea here is that there is some sort of common knowledge across the universe where if somebody had the probability of one of these things going uh, you know, vastly wrong or vastly right, depending on how you view it, uh, uh, if, they were, if they really were off base, they might be willing to buy or sell this possibility um, for more or less than it was worth. So the idea is that the current value of these various stocks, if you want to think about it that way, really do reflect the total knowledge of what the likelihood is that this thing is going to happen. So if um, you want to look at uh, the um, probability that Mark Rubio is going to become the vice presidential nominee for the Republican Party, um, you have to pay basically $2.40 for that, for that uh, option. And if he is not uh, uh, nominated, and there's a whole bunch of you know, sort of uh, legalese statements behind this of what it means to be nominated, blah, blah, blah. But assuming there's a moment in time when this thing cuts off, if he's not nominated, um, that holding this piece of stock will be worth $0. And if he is nominated, it will be worth $10. Right. So right now, there's something like a one in four chance, effectively, that he's going to become the vice presidential nominee for the Republican Party. You can pull over uh, the data from Intrade um, uh, for these three different races. And what you'll do is you'll crawl the uh, HTML that comes back from all three of these. You'll figure out who all the different people are that are part of all of these different um, races. Some of them will be the same person, like the probability that uh, Rick Perry will be the presidential nominee is essentially zero. Um, but the probability that he'll be the VP nominee is not zero. So create another table in your database called candidates and write a program to automatically populate it with biographical information about the candidate where you'll essentially automatically uh, crawl the Wikipedia articles on these candidates. Um, include at least a hometown, home state, party affiliation, birth date, and a link to a local file containing a photographic portrait of the candidate which you will automatically also pull over from the web. And then create a table called predictions and populate it with the prediction data, which you'll get. You can essentially get all of this data in CSV file for the lifetime of um, this uh, for the lifetime of this race. Um, and uh, what you'll will basically ask you to sort of intelligently create uh, primary keys and foreign keys, and then we'll ask you two questions. Use your database to plot as a function of time the probability of a candidate with a home state north or south of the Mason-Dixon line winning each race. So you have to look up what the Mason-Dixon line is if you don't already. But this is kind of interesting to see because you're going to aggregate over all candidates and sum over all candidates those that were basically from the north and those were from the south. I don't know what that looks like. It'll look like something. Um, but it, you might be interested to know what it looks like. So essentially, is the south winning or the north winning? Um, and then uh, one of the things that you might want to be uh, want, might be curious about is the efficient market theory, um, where it, you would think that the probability that Obama wins is equal to one minus the sum over all the Republican uh, candidates uh, for all time um, that they win. So this means, like, as a function of time, if Obama's probability of going down uh, is going down, then you'd think that the sum of all the other candidates is, is going up. But that's not going to be true in general, and that's because this is not a very efficient market. So you find the moments when this is not true, and um, you might want to try to cross-correlate that with events that are happening. Uh, um, you can look at Google News or something to figure out what was happening on those days or around those days when this market became inefficient. And for now, you can keep on doing this. And every time you notice there's an inefficiency, you can arbitrage. Yeah. And you can give us back all the money that you make. <laughs> OK, so some hints. Um, you don't have to do all the first steps in order. You may want to just create the tables ahead of time and think about the columns and the structures of those tables. And then you want to crawl through and populate those tables. That's probably how I would do it. Um, and because uh, there's, not a, there's basically not data on a daily basis or even hourly basis um, you, for, for many of these uh, different candidates, 
if you're going to be summing up stuff as a function of time, you probably want to interpolate like every day or every two hours or something um, so that you can put everything in an apples to apples sense and do that, do that sort of comparison for f. Um, you can play with pandas. Um, and this is a hyperlink in the PDF that's already up in vSpace. Uh, we'll get to pandas in a couple of weeks, but pandas is a, a really nice way of uh, manipulating time series data where they're sparse and they're not naturally and easily alignable. And then you could play with SQL Alchemy instead of doing this all within SQL Lite 3 module. Are there any questions about that? Everyone's super jazzed? Okay. Go out in arbitrage. <laughs>